South Africa is experiencing a fundamental political realignment. Joining me to discuss what this means for the future of the country and its politics is the outgoing CEO of the Institute of Race Relations, Dr. Franz Cronier, and I'm also delighted to be joined by the incoming CEO of the Institute of Race Relations, Dr. John Endres. So, Franz, let's start with you. We've just finished an election, and we're speaking on Monday, the 8th of November. And as we speak today, there are frantic negotiation talks happening between the various opposition parties, and also the ANC is engaged in its own dialogues. Uh, what do you make of the political landscape post the local government elections? Uh, it looks, David, in many respects as we expected that it would. And that's an expectation that goes back, back a long time. Um, in 2012, we attracted a lot of ridicule and criticism when we said that we expect that the ANC will lose its national majority. And we put a date on that. We said it, we thought it would happen in 2024. And uh, turns out we were too, we weren't uh, uh, sharp enough in that. It came two years before, because they're now down to 46. We made that call then, not as a guess, but because we could see where the trends that are responsible for political opinion and ANC support were headed. These are, and these are well understood. We've spoken about them lots over the years, uh, growth, investment, uh, confidence in the government, the polling. And we, we, made, we saw those trends. We, we said the ANC won't reform again. And um, the consequence will be that they'll lose an election. So that at, at the time, we were ridiculed. I mean, the, we, we were quite mad. And... Um, yeah, now it's it's down to that, and there's the horse trading over future coalitions, which is what we said would, of course, happen after this moment. And um, so, not not it, it's pretty much how we called it and expected it to be. And the great question now is, which way will those coalitions go? Because from that, you will get a very kind of clear read on um, what life's going to be like in South Africa over the next decade. So, John, let's turn to you. Uh, for many analysts, the expectation was always that one day a opposition party would grow large enough that it would challenge the dominance of the ANC. Uh, but you put forward a, a different thesis last week in various articles that you wrote for the Daily Friend and videos also for the CRA channel. Uh, what was the metaphor that you used to describe this new shift in our politics? Yeah, David, that's absolutely right. Um, and I think that as South Africans, we do tend to have a little bit of a savior complex. And we expect uh, one big solution to all the problems to emerge uh, from an unknown uh, location. Uh, and then we are surprised when it doesn't. And the metaphor we developed to describe the situation we find ourselves in now in the aftermath of the first November elections is that in the past, you can imagine that there was a mighty buffalo who roamed the savannah and dominated the entire landscape all around him, which is the ANC. And that mighty buffalo was accompanied by a little calf, the EFF, and analysts would look at these two animals and wonder from which bush a lion was going to leap to take them down. And people would look at various bushes and look at various critters on the savannah wondering if they were going to be the ones to take the buffalo down. And as it turns out, there is no lion coming to the rescue, so to speak. But rather what we find is that there is a pack of wild dogs that is a collection of smaller parties that are uh, potentially united in their opposition to the ANC and EFF if they can uh, be made to understand that they pursue a common objective. And if they do, and then this collection of smaller parties, the wild dog parties, does have the potential to bring down the mighty buffalo. I think we can already, uh, carrying this metaphor further, assume that the buffalo is not as strong as it once was. Um, the ANC came in with 46% in these last elections. Um, it is weakened by a variety of factors, including a loss of credibility, uh, a loss of public support as a result of poor service delivery and corruption scandals, but also weakened through other factors, including a lack of money both within the party 
where salaries to employees haven't been paid for a, a number of months, as well as in the state where the fiscal deficit is very considerable, the debt is escalating, and we find ourselves in quite a difficult position. And all of these are signs that the Buffalo is weakening um, and the opposition parties are spotting an opportunity in the run-up to 24, 2024 and wondering what possible use they can make of that. And these opposition parties, the wild dogs, as you describe them, they're often not entirely on the same page. They have ideological differences. Uh, some of them have personality clashes that existed in the past that drove them to splinter away in the case of Action SA and the DA. Uh, so can this very disparate set of interests actually coordinate their activities sufficiently to bring down that mighty buffalo? That, that seems to be quite a tall order and quite a lot of opportunities for uh, those potential coalitions to break down as well. I think what it requires is a kind of mindset shift, because of course, as a, a leader of a political party or as the strategic management, you are very focused on identifying your core constituency and serving that core constituency. And that is the reason why we have multiple parties. Um, so you've got uh, sort of a more Christian oriented party in the form of the African Christian Democratic Party, the ACDP. Uh, you've got the Democratic Alliance, which hues classically liberal. You've got the Freedom Front Plus and Encarta the Freedom Party, which are both regional or ethnic parties in their orientation. And all of these parties do seem quite different but we believe they also have certain very fundamental values in common, such as a commitment to property rights, to a market economy, and to the rule of law. And if this uh, shift in mindset can be clarified to these parties, I think they will be, uh, begin to understand that this is very important, that they have these things in common, because they stand in juxtaposition against the ANC and EFF, which do not hold these values as highly. Uh, and that, I think, is the basis for the idea that they can work together in opposition to the ANC and have quite a good chance of bringing it down. But as you point out, success is by no means guaranteed. And there is this tendency to snipe at each other, to squabble, to nip, to bite each other. And maybe you know, that isn't the nature of wild dogs. Maybe it is also in the nature of political parties. And perhaps we shouldn't let ourselves be too concerned and too distracted by that, but rather keep our minds focused on the grand objective. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of noise, uh, a lot of toing and froing over the next few years. But now, France, you for a long time have expounded the thesis that South Africa is primed for the emergence of a center-right movement. Uh, South Africans tend to be fairly socially conservative, and maybe some of these voters who have long been disaffected with the ANC and some of its more socialist orientation have struggled to find a political home elsewhere for whatever reason but now are potentially being animated and activated to support a new movement. And it certainly seems that Herman Mashaba embodies some of this uh, and his Action SA. What do you make of, of Action SA in particular? And because it doesn't seem to be very strong in terms of its ideological character, um, but it seems to be playing a very interesting strategic game at the moment. What are some of your thoughts on, on Mashaba and, and his movement? Um, David, yeah. Look, the the cliche and the fear on South Africa was that it would turn to the left and it would become another failed Zimbabwe, Venezuela kind of socialist experiment. And we said that's, of course, a great risk. It remains a risk. But, there's the, but the leaning of the country is actually not there. It leans to the right. And not, not so much being socially conservative. It's, it's quite socially liberal. In, in, it's quite uh, economically conservative. And I suppose it's not in terms of law and order, it's not socially liberal. It's a country where cell phone thieves are beaten to death in the streets. And many of the observers of that across every social and political strata feel better about themselves in, in the aftermath of such a lynching. But that's, that's not a socially liberal society. And um, the, the missing link in South African politics we sensed was a movement that could capture that conservatism on the um, right of the spectrum, obviously, but, but within black communities, what, what we've called over the years the rise of black conservatives. And um, we haven't had that on the scene. Musi Maimane could have been it, uh, but I think he was so cajoled by his handlers at the time, 
that they screwed that up. The baton therefore falls in a sense to Mr. Mashaba. Now, what is a black conservative? For us, it's you're absolutely unambiguous about capitalism, a market economy, and wealth accumulation. That, that you're clear on. This, this isn't about a big redistributive socialist state. You are clear on the importance of the private sector in leading the investment to make employment and wealth creation possible. That, that you're very solid on. You're, you're strongly uh, anti the kind of incompetence, corruption, and malfeasance that came to characterize the ANC. This would be the classic definitions, not necessarily the uh, attaches to every aspect of ASA's uh, work. And you're strongly anti-racist, and the ASA thing has, has that as well. And if you polled South Africans at any point over the past 20 years, you'd see this thing is a winner. If you, if you put that offer across, you're going to win uh, a significant degree of political support. And I think it's that force that ASA has tapped a little bit in the support that it's won in this most recent election. And if it is able to play a constructive role now as a member of that pack that John describes, the effect could be to contribute uh, significantly to the defeat of the ANC in 2024, because that is now perfectly possible. I, I, in fact, think it's likely that the ANC will be defeated in 2024 if the parties to the pact that John describes are able to cooperate very closely and effectively on the core issues. And the only reason I think the ANC will escape such a fate now three years or so, two and a half years from now, is if the pack is split or if pack members turn on each other to settle silly historical and personal gripes and scores. If that happens, any pack member, if you're a pack member, and at this point, after getting this mandate from South Africa, you decide that what you're going to do with that is to turn on your peers in the pack and try and, 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 and uh, uh, go after them. The ANC escapes and it's in the clear. It's as good as just putting the ANC straight back in power to continue with another five or 10 years of destructive policy and looting. So if I have a concern, it's a concern we've reached this point. I don't think South Africans realize how close to the moment of reform we perhaps are. It's 901 days or something from when we film this that, that the next election probably is going to take place. And, and the morning afterwards, with the ANC below 50, this broad coalition could actually set about forming a reformist government, introducing what many people had hoped the New Dawn reforms would be. We, of course, told you that they wouldn't be New Dawn reforms, and, and that we were, we were castigated for, but later proved right. So we're close to this thing. And one other thing I'll tell you, then I'll stop, is, is the pact John describes is a necessary step towards reform. The DA had become a kind of coalescing point for proper opposition to the ANC. But that meant you were sticking black conservatives and evangelical Christians and all and liberals and all sorts of people in one organization. And liberals, which is what the DA are, and conservatives, I mean, the mainstream confuses them with each other, but they're entirely different things, will fight with each other if you put them in the same tent. There are enough issues of disagreement, not to mention evangelical Christians in the mix and all, all sorts of others. By breaking them up and allowing each of these little groups to sit in their own tent, you actually get, how's this? I've never used this phrase before, unity and diversity, and, and sufficiently so to beat the ANC. It's a winner, and it will work as long as the parties to this front actually have the primary objective in mind. And by the time you watch this, you'll, you'll have a better sense of that. But if you've seen one of them peel away, uh, uh, it, it will be it will be very hard. Then, if that happens, then if, if they're not going to work together towards reform, then that avenue to success for South Africa, the PAC, isn't going to work. Then you need to look at new alt alternatives, and and there there are a myriad of those that 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 will come up. 
So John, how is the ANC going to respond to this new environment? Because they're going to be well aware of their declining fortunes and are going to be using the usual levers at their disposal, patronage and political influence to try and persuade some of these smaller parties to still uh, support them. So how also will they respond in terms of their policy proposal to the South African electorate? And thirdly, how will they also treat their uh, erstwhile youth league members who now form the EFF? Uh, will they be reaching out to the EFF in an attempt to, to bolster their, uh, their offering? I think uh, maybe David, as I get into the answers to your questions, let me just complete a, a thought from what Franz said earlier, which is that you and I uh, have spoken on an earlier show about uh, the punctuated equilibrium and I think this is now exactly the, the point which we've reached. And the punctuated equilibrium theory says that you have a very long period of stability where things don't change very much, and then a very short, sudden period of big change. And I think that's exactly what's happening now. Uh, such punctuations in the equilibrium don't come along very often. And that also means that when they do come, it is very important to recognize them for what they are and to make use of the opportunity that they present. I think if you miss the opportunity, then you know, you're know you stuck in another new equilibrium and who knows when the next opportunity to do something interesting is going to come about. In terms of the ANC, my expectation is that it uh, looks ahead across these three years to 2024. It realizes it is in trouble and it is going to uh, understand that if it wants to implement a legislative agenda maybe even including constitutional amendments, now is the opportunity to do it. Because after 2024, it might no longer be able to do so. So speaking firstly of the constitutional amendments, we know there's a very important one in the works at the moment uh, on section 25 of the constitution, that is the property rights clause, which the ANC wants to amend to enable expropriation without compensation. Uh, to pass this amendment, it is uh, reliant, dependent on support from the EFF in order to get a two-thirds majority. Currently, that two-thirds majority exists as an option, but probably after 2024, it will no longer exist. So the ANC and the EFF will be very clear that this is their window of opportunity. If they want to pass it, they have to do it now. Mm. The same also, I think, applies to normal legislation. Um, you know, If the ANC ends up with below 50%, in 2024 or after 2024, it might no longer be able to dictate the legislative agenda. It may have to negotiate far more to make far more compromises than it is accustomed to making. And that is not an appealing prospect. So my expectation is that in the run up to 2024, we're going to see quite a lot of pressure on parliament, on the legislative process to introduce um, legal changes, which the ANC considers to be important for its agenda. Um, the ANC might well recognize that it is in trouble and wonder what it can do to get out of trouble. And here again, legislative changes can form part of that. So the ANC might think of measures it can introduce to shore up its, its support. But my sense is that most of those changes will be driven by an ideology that is hostile to the changes that would need to be made for it to shore up its support. And they will rather undermine the party's strength. Um, but the party, I think, sees no alternative to pursuing those kinds of policies. So it will aim for more redistribution, uh, for more state power, for more state involvement in the economy. And all of these things will be as counterproductive in the next three years as they have been in the past three years. When it comes to the ANC's relationship with the EFF, um, early signs from the coalition negotiations are that the ANC is being ostracized a bit. So there's been quite a large number of parties who have already said that they would not work with the ANC, um, the DA among them, uh, Action SA as well, the IFP in KwaZulu-Natal um, as well. And that is sort of closing down the option space for the ANC quite a bit. And it is uh, leaving it stuck in a small room with the EFF. And so I think that there is going to be uh, a tunadering between the EFF and the ANC in certain municipalities, and that may well also spill over into the national political arena. Uh, and that is a concerning development in one sense, because the EFF is quite radical and its policies are even 
more concerning than those of the ANC. But on the other hand, it may well be a process that accelerates the loss of popular support for the kinds of policies that both of these par parties endorse, and it may hasten the change that might occur in 2024. Yeah, and obviously we're recording on Monday the 8th of November, so we'll see what happens between now and the publication of this video. But Franz, let's turn now to the DA because they suffered some reversals. They went down to 22% at the uh, overall national aggregate level, uh, but still the largest opposition party and could potentially play an outsized role in forming this new uh, potential broad united democratic front against the ANC. Where do you think the party is at at the moment? Because they've had some leadership changes over the last year or two um, and seem to be ideologically at least a bit more coherent. But is their offering resonating with the electorate? And how are they going to be building their strategy in the build up to 2024? I think the DA is doing really great, David. Um, they, they lost votes, yeah. But those votes weren't lost to the opposition. Those were DA votes that moved into the separate little tents that I spoke about earlier. And that's, that's very important. If you, if you want to vote for a little tent that's got, got, got issues about, I don't know, whatever, the ACDP does stuff about anti-vaccinating, which I think is completely mad. But let, let have that option that's there. If you feel more comfortable voting for a party that, plays up the importance of your culture and language, that's great. But it's not a thing a Liberal Party is really able to do for you. Then that's fine. So, so the DA, yeah, but, but what I call the sort of broader block is, has grown in terms of a chair of the vote. And it's grown because of this splitting up, this unity and diversity. I think the, 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 the sense I get of the DA on coalitions and the like is very pragmatic. You'll know, of course, whether we're right. And, and my sense is the view has become, and I want to tell you a bit about the ANC's view on coalitions, that they'll go into coalitions where they've got a really solid base to work from. So where all the partners to the coalition agree in the broader terms, want to do the same thing and want to work together. Where that's not possible, go sit in opposition. These, these half-baked coalitions with, with your ideological adversaries can never work. And, and uh, I, I hope they'll have the good sense to steer clear of those. And to say then, look, if you don't give a mandate to the, this block to actually run the town or city you live in, they can't come and run it after the fact for you. And you've got to, uh, you might vote for them, but you actually got to do more to get more people out onto the streets and to vote for them as well if you want a, a different uh, future. That's good. On the ANC, uh, they, they, uh, as, as I sort of, read things at at the highest levels there's a sense to go into opposition as well um i mean if 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 the ramaphosa anc now gets into a formal alliance with the eff mr ramaphosa is going to go to an investment conference and say hi <laughs> my government is trying to grow the economy and and be successful and and so on I mean it will it will it will reveal what we've always held is is is, is the lie about the idea that the ANC is, is set for reform. So that's not assured. At the lowest levels of the ANC, there's a different mood. Because if you've been a councillor in, in an ANC-run corner of the world, then the chances are that, that you've been stealing. And you've probably been stealing in cahoots with your EFF mates and a couple of others. It's not just those two. Now you've lost, you're the ANC. You want to get back into that municipality. You've lost your majority. You're going to run straight to the EFF and say, let's make a deal. So that at a local level, you can continue managing your fiefdom as you have done. So there at the local of the ANC and at the national, there's a different attitude towards coalitions. But you know, the ANC is a decrepit organization, bereft of ideas but but even then despite that there is a sense at its highest levels that if we are now in with the EFF we this is I mean either we've got to destroy the country and the economy sink its constitutional uh, safeguards and and hang on as best we can do Venezuela or uh, we we're completely screwed 
because people will realize that no reform could possibly come out of a coalition like this. So the, the sense to sit on the sidelines is also good. You might therefore get this, this peculiar position where in some districts of the country, no one is falling over each other to go and govern them. And, and rather sitting back and saying that they're not going, then a whole lot of interesting things happen that I'm not good enough to tell you. But, um, but, but then, you know, these things do then happen to your town. It's a no one's in charge. No one wants to run. No one has a majority. So, John, we at the Center for Risk Analysis release Monday morning risk alerts, which are short two-page alerts flagging the key risks in South Africa and the world for our clients. And the closing sentences of this Monday's risk alert was regarding service delivery in some of these hung councils, which you suggested uh, might not necessarily improve, in fact, might get worse. And the, the closing line was, we would advi our advice is to anticipate bumpy governance in the years ahead and to create as much self-sufficiency in your household and community as you can muster in the interim. And I suppose these are going to be some of the transitional pains and disruptions associated with this new punctuation of the equilibrium. Um, so do you care to flesh that out in, in a bit more detail? Because it seems that service delivery is going to suffer under this period of interregnum where, as Gramsci said, the old uh, has yet to die, but the new cannot be born. Uh, what are we looking at in terms of uh, the, the actual experience of ordinary South Africans uh, in this country and their experience of government? Well, I think we had 27 hung councils in 2016. Those are councils where there was no single party that had over 50% of the share of the vote. And now we've got 70 out of 213 councils. So about a third of all councils in South Africa now are hung councils where no single party has a majority. Now, the interpretation here is that we are not very good at coalitions uh, as a country, uh, given what we've seen in Nelson Mandela Bay, in Johannesburg and Swane. So if we're going to see coalitions all over the place and they're all as bad as those coalitions were, then governance is not going to improve. And uh, I've, I've seen comments that uh, you know, governance in many towns has already collapsed under the ANC, even when it had a majority. So what difference is it going to make if there's no majority and you've just got a group of parties you know, struggling to run a place? But uh, I do think that it is more likely to get worse, um, uh, at best stay the same, but not likely to get better. And the reason for that is that these various parties in the coalitions uh, in all likelihood are going to uh, find it difficult to work with one another smoothly uh, and that there will be lots of jockeying for positions and for power that will create instability and volatility in administration, which citizens will experience as uh, worse service delivery. So I think in the next three years, we'll see a continuation of the theme that France and I have been speaking about to audiences in various parts of the country, and that is the receding state. Um, you know, that, that really was most found its clearest expression in July in KwaZulu-Natal, where the core function of the state was nowhere to be seen, when large numbers of people went on looting sprees uh, and uh, on protesting sprees, uh, and were left unchecked by the state. The state was nowhere. Uh, and that, as a matter of fact, continues to be the case until today, where after the unrest, the government announced that there were 12 instigators uh, and that the investigators were making good progress in identifying them and bringing them to book. But as a matter of fact, no such thing has happened. And I think the state really doesn't uh, really have a, a good handle on what's going on, nor the ability to do anything about it. That is a trend that's likely to continue over the next three years. Uh, the money isn't getting any easier. It's going to become even less. Competence in the central administration won't increase. It'll become worse. And therefore, you are going to be exposed to a failing state as an individual, as a family, as a community, as a business. And you must make preparations for that. Um, and that means that wherever you can, work with your community, um, with uh, allies, with friends, with businesses in your area, to make sure that you're able to keep producing the services that you need to make um, a life sustainable and, and, and livable, uh, and then you'll be okay. But I think really the motto now is to get through the next three years in the best shape you can uh, and uh, try to work towards this objective of uh, a new um, government in 2024, even if it is a coalition, 
but one that can introduce the sweeping uh, governance and policy reforms that give us a chance to uh, get out of the mess that we find ourselves in. So France, in the immediate aftermath of the riots, we had you on the podcast and we spoke about many things, uh, including developing a plan B, uh, which was the final chapter of your recent book uh, on the future of South Africa. Uh, do you care to elaborate on some of those themes? And uh, has any of your thinking shifted given the changes that we've experienced in politics, would you revise your advice or would you stick to your original recommendations? No, we, we'd stick to it. We wouldn't change anything. Plan B started in a newspaper column years ago where, you know, you have to write every Sunday. So I said, you know, plan B and huge response, mostly critical, saying as, as ever, I mean, this was the sort of rule in an art. It's been the rule for IRR analysis for almost 100 years. The IRR says something, and then the commentariat howls and screams and says, no, that's wrong and terrible. You mustn't do that. And about, then about 10 years later, it's usually about a 10-year lag time, the commentariat catches up. And we said develop a plan B, and plan B just meant hedge yourself on South Africa. Because if you're not hedged, there's no way that you're going to be able to continue to play a positive role in influencing the trajectory of the country. So if you, if you were, for example, completely invested in the RAND or in property or something and the currency collapses and the, the property is expropriated, you're sunk. You'd have no base of influence to operate from. You're, you're a desperate refugee uh, looking for a new future. If you hedge yourself well on South Africa and you do that not just financially in terms of asset allocations and things, you do it in terms of your career. Where can you work and for whom? Are you going to stick it out in the civil service? Are you going to stick it out in large corporations that, that, that we knew would become incredibly what was later called woke? I don't know there was such a word at the time, but that's what they became. You actually want to stick it out there. It's going to be tough. Where in the world or in the country can you live? Could you, you know, move out of the north of South Africa if it starts to crumble? And it subsequently did. That remains the advice completely. And well-hedged people, People with options. What it means is you've got choices, and it's not a South African thing. If you want to survive in a volatile emerging market, and that's all that we are, you need lots of choices. The more choices you have, the more robust you are, the less vulnerable you are to intimidation and attack by the state, which means that you speak up and you challenge the state when it loses its way. So the advice remains absolutely that, and, and now are sharpened by the prospect of John's uh, wild dog pack tearing down the ANC buffalo. So John, if that buffalo is weakened and goes below 50% in 2024, there's going to be this huge temptation to align themselves with the EFF. Do you think that the EFF would want to go into a coalition and support an ANC government under those circumstances? And wouldn't that actually be a worse situation for the overall state of South Africa. We've, we've long uh, heard the concern in public that the EFF would go back together with the ANC. It is an offshoot of the ANCs. It shares many of its ideological convictions and underpinnings. Um, and that was always the, I think, the fear that that would be the outcome, an ANC-EFF coalition that ruled South Africa. And the counter argument, which I find very persuasive, is that there are good reasons why neither of those two parties would really want to get into this. From the ANC's perspective, to invite the EFF into its tent would mean to invite the most dangerous adversary that exists in the South African political landscape into, the, into its own house. Uh, and the consequences could be quite <laughs> devastating for the ANC, uh, because I think they would be outmaneuvered, outthought, um, and probably uh, uh, placed out into the wild at short notice. So for the ANC, it is very risky to invite the EFF into its own tent. From the EFF's perspective, looking at the ANC, it sees a movement in decline, one that has run out of ideas, um, out of energy, out of intellectual uh, capability, and that is heading down in popular um, support, in credibility, and is that really the kind of movement that you would want to tie yourself to? And so for the EFF, it might make more sense to rather go its own way, to remain in, in opposition and to present its radical and very clearly presented uh, policy program to the public 
and try to, to win support that way. Um, that having been said, 2024 is three years uh, away. And it may be that the EFF by that time realizes that it's not making any headway with the South African public. We've seen that in its electoral outings so far, its support level has not budged far from 10%. And it may say that, you know, we're not going to break out of this low support level by ourselves. So we do actually need to hitch ourselves to the ANC and see if the two of us together can't pull ourselves up to a higher support level. But I think it is going to be a little bit of a, of a desperate ploy uh, and one that uh, they would not choose if they had a better alternative. So, Franz, I'd like to turn the conversation now to your time leading the Institute. And I think a, a few key battles really stick out in my mind that characterize your time leading the IRR. I think the one is the attempts to push back expropri expropriation without compensation, the EWC uh, amendment to Section 25 of the Constitution. I think the IRR was at the front line of the campaign to raise the alarm around this. I think the other was the uh, arguments that we put out into the public domain and advising our clients that the so-called reform agenda of Mr. Ramaphosa's presidency uh, was essentially uh, smoke and mirrors and there was no such thing. And then I think uh, perhaps uh, less prominent, but no less important, was our advice about the, the role of ideology and culture in informing politics, particularly around the kind of new uh, race-based identity politics that seems to have swept the world, particularly the Western world, uh, critical race theory and so on. And uh, the IR has been very vocal about the, the risks of that. I do care to reflect on, on some of those themes and the role that the IRR has played in that battle of ideas. Yeah, yeah. well, look, property rights were always important. I mean, much of the IRR's work in opposition to apartheid was around property rights. And the reason is property rights are the basis of liberty in every free society. Because if your property rights are intact, the state can't intimidate you, threaten you, dispossess you in an attempt to get you to change your mind about a position. So that was that was central. And um, through the, with the exceptions of water and mineral, the ANC through its first decade is generally okay on property rights. And after it removed Mr. Mbeki in 2007, at that conference, we, we saw that the mood had changed in the party. The left of the ANC was back in charge again the first iteration of the of the new expropriation bill appeared in 2008 and uh, what this was about was an attempt to use the historical question of land in South Africa as a pretext to erode property rights more broadly with the ANC being of the view that it was unlikely to reform to save the economy and itself, given those trends I spoke about. So they go hard on property rights from around 2008. And it's, it's just three years later that we make the call that these guys are going to lose an election. And I felt that we had the same uh, uh, point of departure. We knew they weren't going to reform and they were likely to lose. They knew that as well and realized that they needed to have the power to seize assets without compensation if that threat emerged. So we, we, we fought that incredibly hard. It's uh, going on now, uh, uh, how many years later? 10, 12 years later. And um, I think we, we held a very important line. The frustration in that fight was the opposition that we got, not from the ANC, as much as from business and organized agriculture, other civil society groups, the media, diplomats, and foreign observers because all of them said again, we were wrong, and that this wasn't a serious thing. This was an effort to do land reform. Now, anyone who had the, any on the ground understanding of the ANC's land reform policies, or let alone how it runs state institutions that are meant to care for the poor, such as public schools or hospitals or police stations, would know that the ANC was not suddenly possessed with a sense of social justice, and they decided to uplift the downtrodden. And we fought that thing very hard in the face of immense opposition from people that should have been our allies and supporters, but prevailed, I think, to this point. 
held out against the, the odds and later succeeded in convincing uh, to an extent um, banks, corporations, foreign investors that this was, was a major crisis. But, but always, David, the, the, on property rights, the fight within to convince the allies that they were on the line here was far more difficult than, 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 than holding back the, the sort of revolutionary enthusiasm of the ANC. That we could have done easily and won easily. It was only because that revolutionary enthusiasm was aided and abetted by naive uh, uh, groups outside of the party that this thing has advanced as far as it has. And South Africa in many ways is a leading indicator in terms of race-based politics and some of the dangers and negative externalities that can arise from that. And the IRR has been uh, warning about the, the risks of critical race theory. What are some of your reflections on that? Because many of our critics will say, oh, you're just importing uh, these uh, battles, these ideological battles from the United States, and this is some kind of Republican uh, pet cause, uh, we see things a bit differently, don't we, France? I don't think you can call for racial justice a Republican pet cause, but, you know, the critics will. Again, it's a, it's a, I don't think you ever really run the Institute of Race Relations. You, you inherit its principal positions and you try and, and advance them. And the fight against racial discrimination the idea that your race is very important and that you should be treated differently in a society on the grounds of the color of your skin was, of course, the central uh, position that the IRA, that informed the IRR's opposition to apartheid for all those years. Then, of course, it made you very leftward. You were a very rude things, and you were uh, obviously an agent of the Soviet Union. Now, holding that same position, mean you again accused of very rude things. But this time you're, you're an agent of some alt-right global conspiracy to, 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 it just never becomes very clear quite what its objective is, this, this conspiracy. So that position we held very strongly and we, we continue to hold it, that the color of your skin should be irrelevant to how you're treated in society. Your race doesn't really matter much at all. I mean, society makes it matter, but intrinsically it, it doesn't matter. And that when it comes to points of empowerment, the way to do it is to empower people because they are poor, not because of the color of their skin. And we've, we've put that across time and again over the years. And in the face of opponents who say it's wrong, I've never got an opponent to tell us why it's wrong. Why would it not work to help the poor why is the only way to help the poor to help people, well, in our case, who happen to be black? Uh, it's it's the, that that, and I think we've 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 kept that criticism very much alive and very prominent uh, through an era when almost every other actor, now and again, some of the political ones recovered their senses recently, have uh, abandoned that principle and advanced the idea that your race is a very important thing and society should determine how it treats people on the basis of their race. So, so we held that line, I, I think, and uh, again, no support from the broader uh, world, rather uh, the opposite, I would say, uh, the corporations, business uh, and the like. But um, a, a position I think we were all very, very proud to hold and one that um, maintained the the, the, the legacy of the organization. Yeah, and I think for those viewers and listeners who are interested in the legacy of the IRR, I'd encourage them to listen to my interview with John Kane Berman, who led the Institute from 1983 until he handed over to you in about 2014, France. But now, France, you are handing over the baton uh, to John. And John, you know, I think that we've, we've really reflected on the work of the IRR recently, but how do you see the IRR evolving under your leadership, particularly in this new uh, paradigmatic 
shift that we've seen in the country's politics. And I have no doubt that you'll continue to uphold the principles of non-racialism, limited government, a market economy, and the rule of law, which the IRR has stood for for nearly a century. But strategically, how are you seeing the IRR positioning itself within this new landscape? Mm. I think the, the, the last point you make, David, is really the most important, which is that these principles that the IRR was built upon uh, remain the same and have remained the same for a very long time, and they will also continue to remain the same into the future. One of the key points there is that um, as, a, as a liberal or classically liberal, it is very important that people be treated as individuals and accorded respect as individuals rather than as members of collectives. And I think this is where this visceral dislike for ideas like critical race theory and race-based policy comes from. We really don't like this idea of treating people as uh, interchangeable uh, members of the same set identified by a certain race or other demographic characteristic. We want people to be treated as individuals and we want every individual to be given the best opportunity in life for social mobility, for progress in their own lives and to provide for themselves and for their families. And the policies to do that are well known, they're well established, they've been tested many, many times throughout the world. We know what they are. And uh, if we want to achieve that, then we need these uh, principles to be upheld and policies based on those principles to be introduced. So that remains the mission, the same it's been uh, you know, for uh, many, many years all along. I do think that we find ourselves in a slightly different position now uh, politically. And I think also in terms of how society uh, functions and is structured. So the fact that uh, political parties have become quite fragmented, I think also reflects across society in the sense that people have, um, uh, have become used to being addressed uh, on a much more granular level than they were in the past. So in the, let's say the second half of the 20th century, you'd have very large uh, parties in the developed world, so-called Volksparteien in Germany, or a two-party system in the UK and the USA uh, that dominated the landscape. And most people would fit into one of those camps and they would accept that the uh, degree of overlap between their values and the party they supported wasn't 100%, but they would say, that's fine. You know, we can disagree on a few things. People in recent times have become far less tolerant of such differences. And I think this is reflected in the fragmentation of the party political landscape. What this means for the IRR is that we also tailor our message to uh, more precisely defined target groups, um, mirroring in a way what happened in the political sphere um, and that is a ref uh, reflected in the many platforms that we uh, now run, which I think we will uh, continue to run, we'll probably add additional platforms to that, that allow people to uh, identify themselves with specific aspects of those fundamental values that we represent. Um, so we've got the Daily Friend as a newspaper, for example. Um, we have uh, uh, the, the CRA, that talks to the business community and the diplomatic corps, the government, etc. And we have various other platforms that talk to specific target groups. That is a strategy we'll continue uh, pursuing over the coming years, um, but you'll find that all of those platforms will endorse the same values of non-racialism, um, the importance of free markets, of property rights, and the rule of law, uh, with the aim of getting those principles to be more widely accepted and used as the basis for policy in this country. And John, many of our critics, most notably uh, those who penned an open letter recently in South Africa's various press outlets, accused us of abandoning our principles uh, and being unmoored from the ideological origins that characterized the IRR in the past. Do you have anything to say to, to people who might think that the IRR has evolved in a direction that's different to what it once was? I think it, it ties into what Franz said earlier. Uh, so we sort of always stay in the same place, but society changes around us. Um, and as, as society moves to the right, we begin to look very left. And as society begins to move to the left, we begin to look very right. Um, but I think that is an illusion. Um, the IRR really has been very steadfast, you might even say intransigent, in maintaining its position um, and really sticking to the classically liberal uh, foundations um, of, our, of our beliefs. Uh, so I would dismiss those accusations. I think the IRR continues to be a classically liberal organization 
as it has been for many years and it will continue to be so. And France, do you have any final words as your time leading the Institute draws to a close? Do you have any reflections on, on this new transition for yourself and, and for the organization? No, um, but I'll tell you that I'd love to be invited back to, to appear on some of these shows and, and, and see a bit how, how South Africa ultimately evolves. I think we've, we've put ourselves now in a position where there's a serious prospect that uh, reform could be just three years away inside of that. And uh, those positions don't come around all that often. And the, the crises to precipitate that are now all upon us. And if we have some kind of great global pullback, which could happen ahead of that, the effect on South Africa is so devastating that yeah, the transition, the next transition, call it that, uh, last one was 30 years ago. The next transition is now within reach. And um, I hope that the parties to that front to bring it about realize what opportunity there is and that they don't let it slip because that would be, whoever in that group does that, would be unforgivable, given the consequences. Well, Franz, they say the future is another country, and I think that certainly applies to South Africa at this present moment. Well, but um, I also... Franz Lover said that in South Africa, the future is clear, it's the past that's uncertain. <laughs> 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 at times, the one is true, at times, at times the other seems to be true. It's never, never easy to know which. Yeah, and Jan Smuts also said that South Africa is a place where neither the best nor the worst ever happens. So uh, I, I hope that that he is right, although I hope on the upside that we, we manage to take advantage of some of these opportunities. Uh, but Franz, I also wanted to just take this moment to thank you very much for your leadership of the Institute over the years. I know you're not one to uh, put yourself at the forefront of attention. Uh, you've been well supported by a very strong team, but you've also led that organization uh, to, to new and greater heights. So I wanted to sincerely thank you for your leadership. And also, John, I wanted to wish you the very best for the period ahead. I'm very excited about this new chapter for the organization. And I'm sure you'll take it from strength to strength. That will do. And uh, thank you very much for those kind words, David. Um, I think we've got some really exciting times ahead of us uh, and also some hopeful times. Uh, there's, there's a great opportunity to be grabbed, which we, we will position ourselves to do. If you enjoyed this discussion and you're watching on YouTube, please do give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Also leave your comments in the comment section below. And if you're listening on your preferred podcast platform, please do subscribe there as well and leave a five-star review. That really helps the show to grow. My name is David Ansara. Until next week, take care.